What is a city? It is a concentration of civilization. What is civilization? It is mankind's taming and manipulation of the natural world. Civilization is what man creates to make life more suited to his needs and desires. Therefore, a city is a hub where man, where a mass concentration of a population, has been the primary architect of the environment, where humanity has conquered nature to such a degree that it is what mankind, what that population, desires it to be. So why is it that even in incredibly socially conservative countries, these concentrations of their civilization always turn out more liberal relative to the communities that surround them? From Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, to Moscow in Russia, to Budapest in Hungary, Warsaw in Poland, Beijing in China, and of course right here in the United States, where the rural-urban divide is commonly held as the chief division in our country today. Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this every week, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who's donated to us on Patreon, Utreon, and right here on YouTube through channel memberships. Your donations really go a long way to keeping this channel going, and by donating to us across any of these platforms, you'll get access to some great perks including physical merch, a custom designed flag wallpaper, and access to an exclusive members only Discord server where you can enter your scenarios for a chance to have them made into full videos. You can follow the pop-up on screen here, go to the comment section or description to visit any of these pages and support our channel, and of course you can do so by clicking the join button right below this video. If you can't donate anything, consider subscribing and sharing this video to help the channel out. Now, back to the video. Conservatism and liberalism can at times be fairly vague terms with varying meanings depending on whether we're speaking of economics, authority, etc. But for the sake of this video, we'll be honing in on social conservatism and social liberalism as that is often regarded as the key divide within the United States at present. Social conservatism in the truest, natural, and most extreme sense of the word is based in fear and survival. It doesn't matter if the lions are majestic to look at, we must kill them if they come too close to our settlement or we will die. It does not matter if we have a craving for more, we only have so many resources so we must ration what we have or we will die. It doesn't matter if criminals can be reformed, they've proven they are dangerous and must be kept away from the rest of us or we will die, so on and so forth. Social conservatism acknowledges or at least recognizes that the reality of the world is harsh, it is dangerous, and it is unforgiving. Naturally, it makes sense that those populations most removed from the safety and convenience of man's concentrations of civilization, removed from urban hubs and left with a more raw reality of life, would come to recognize these things in their day to day, even if unconsciously, and develop a more pragmatic conservative mindset geared more squarely towards survival. This is as true of domestic populations as it is of comparative international populations. The people of a less developed country will be of a more naturally socially conservative mindset than perhaps even the social conservatives of a more developed country, simply for the fact that they are removed from the same security and convenience afforded in a more developed country and their daily lives require a greater mental focus on survival. It's not surprising then that only about 18% of Americans actually live in truly rural communities, a number which is somewhat consistent with other first world countries in Europe. However, this can be misleading as rural in Europe may constitute a far tamer environment than a rural American community, Western Europe having nearly five times the population density of the United States, and the US being far younger than the countries of Europe, not having tamed its lands to the same level which Europe has. Social conservatism exists on a spectrum with social liberalism at its opposite end. While social conservatism is based in fear, or perhaps better put, caution for the sake of survival, social liberalism is based in idealism. One grows up in a world without lions, without predators, food is always available on the shelves of any store they walk into. The world they come to understand isn't harsh, cruel, or hazardous, it's orderly, it's plentiful, and it's comfortable, tailor-made to meet not only man's needs but his desires, and this comes to be expected. Yet it's still imperfect, and perhaps it always will be. Because for every problem solved and for every convenience added, for the generations growing up with them, these were never improvements, they were simply the baseline, and it can always be made better. Man in this environment is not faced with the same hardships of nature so long as he does not grow up in the lowest of urban classes. Yet that energy to face hardship still exists, and instead of concentrating on survival, man seeks out new obstacles, inadequacies, and injustices to overcome. He becomes idealistic about what the world could be instead of cautious about how it actually is. This idealism is perhaps a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, man in his hub of civilization will always aspire for greater things, but on the other, the more he creates, the more he removes himself from an understanding of reality, and the more he begins to question the old foundations of his civilization, which now seem so antiquated and unnecessary. There's so much hunger in the world, why can't we just give our food away for free? We have so much of it after all. Prison seems so inhumane, why do we need to punish criminals with such harsh conditions? Why do I need to pay for X, Y, and Z? Why can't the government pay for something that seems like an essential right? Why does it matter who can live here? We're all just people after all. 
The laws, traditions, and morals of a civilization gradually erode in urban environments because they are progressively perceived as no longer essential to survival, but merely hindrances to living life more comfortably, more conveniently, and more easily, or sometimes they just stand in the way of urban man's idealized world. Now, the root of liberalization is not the cities themselves. Cities are inevitable so long as civilization continues to advance. Civilization will always attempt to expand, create concentration hubs, and thus produce cities. The root of liberalization is civilization itself. There is perhaps no more conservative a mindset than that of someone whose civilization is in its earliest stages. These populations who would be faced with the full brunt of nature and have zero tolerance for idealism, simply the will to do what is necessary to survive. As populations on the world over civilized become removed from nature's hardships, it will naturally grow progressively idealistic and from that progressively become more liberal generation by generation. This has been the case in course of all history. Roll back the clock to 1800 and the average American would express social views utterly unpalatable to most modern sensibilities on both the left and the right. Wind it back to the Renaissance, an age of liberalization relative to what preceded it, but still an age in which breaking on the wheel was considered an appropriate punishment for criminals, monarchy was commonplace, and the same period in which transatlantic slavery would begin. Wind back to the Bronze Age, and such populations would be shocked if he told them of the relative liberalism of later Roman civilization compared to their own, let alone modern day civilization. Civilization and liberalization go hand in hand. Cities are just a highly concentrated representation of that, and a bellwether for the direction in which the rest of the developed population will move. Now, some conservatives might respond to this with a Ted Kaczynski-esque solution of opposing development entirely, desiring primitivist anarchism as an alternative to civilization or simply calling for an abolition of urban areas. Attempting to end urban communities would cause terrible harm and despair, and would ultimately achieve nothing but delay the inevitable, because once again cities are a product of the liberalizing force, not the source of it. If every city on the planet was destroyed at this very moment, countless new ones would take their place within even a century. And all that will have been accomplished is that mankind's technological and social progress would be slowed, but eventually pick up where it left off. Every dark age is followed by a renaissance and progresses beyond that of the age which preceded it, both in development and in social liberalization. In this regard, the history of social conservatism and social liberalism isn't a pendulum that swings back and forth between cycles. It is a staircase where the ground floor is natural conservatism rooted in survival, and every step is simultaneously technological progression and a progression of social values. Bronze Age civilization advanced until it collapsed, but when it collapsed, it did not regress technologically to square one. Some of that advancement was preserved and continued to advance even higher than the peak of the Bronze Age until there was yet another collapse. But it never regresses to point zero. Mankind never truly starts over with nothing. Now what about just ceasing development altogether, embracing the primitive lifestyle, and existing in this state in perpetuity? Not only would this be a pitiful fate for man if it succeeded, stagnant and without promise for a brighter future, it would not be sustainable because eventually the spark of civilization will emerge again, and mankind will be back where it started, once again having technologically set itself back for a few decades or centuries, but ultimately left with the same situation. If someone wanted to solve for the liberalizing effect of civilization, the solution isn't to abandon civilization entirely, but to attempt to correct it. It is like a medicine that you need to survive, but that comes with predictable side effects. Instead of throwing the medicine away and condemning yourself to death or simply taking them again once you start feeling sick, try to figure out how those side effects could be mitigated or removed. A unique outlier in the measure of liberalism in urban areas is Singapore, and to a lesser extent the other modern fully sovereign city-states of today. Though truthfully, I do not consider Monaco or Vatican City to be good baselines for the simple fact that they are not typical cities. Vatican City has a population smaller than most small towns in the United States and serves a religious function. Therefore, it should be expected that it would be more conservative. Meanwhile, Monaco is in reality a dependency of France without a real military, sovereign currency, or even a significant population, being surpassed by even small American cities like Binghamton, New York. Though that being said, there are some valuable takeaways for its conservative reputation, key among them being that Monaco is a monarchy, there is a high barrier to entry with the cost of living in Monaco being significantly above average, and religion maintains a central role in the city-state's day-to-day life on account of the historic ties between the ruling family and the Catholic Church. Though that being said, an observation of Monaco's history would show that it has in fact liberalized over time. Now, Singapore has the population of a world-class city and is truly sovereign. What has distinguished Singapore so much is its highly structured way of doing things to the point that some have called the country authoritarian. Laws in Singapore are strictly enforced, criminals are punished severely, the federal government holds overwhelming power, and there is a single dominant party which has ruled the city-state since founding. Though this being said, Singapore is still a very young country, and socially liberal sentiments are still rising within the youngest generations of the city-state, just as we would expect anywhere else. 
What we might take away from this is that Singapore and cities in general thrive under conditions of strong government and that the order enforced by the ruling establishment helps to mitigate the liberalizing effects through a degree of regimentation as well as by deterring the compounding liberalizing effects of democratization and globalization. However, we still see Singapore on track to grow more socially liberal even if its government continues to function as it presently does. Because once again, the more we civilize, the more we advance, the more we remove ourselves from the harshness of reality and the more idealistic we become. Something else I want to touch upon is how this relates to immigration. In the United States, it's become a talking point among some conservatives that we should encourage immigration from underdeveloped countries because the people of these countries are more socially conservative than Americans and will naturally vote for conservative policies. There are multiple problems with this reasoning, foremost being that, all other factors aside, if we take a population out of a harsher environment and place them in the well-developed environment of a first world country, then perhaps not them but their children will come to be just as liberal as any other American within the same class bracket. Class being something I must emphasize because even developed environments can be harsh for the poor. Growing up in a low-income neighborhood with a high crime rate will trigger the emergence of a more conservative survival mindset. With the majority of immigrants to the United States ending up in highly developed cities, it's just an inevitability that most will end up opposing conservative policies. This isn't even taking into account the issue of culture and how it ties into conservatism. A conservative Christian from the South and a conservative Muslim from Saudi Arabia may share some overlapping values, but ultimately they want different things. If the Democratic Party insists on LGBT rights, critical theory, or gun control just as examples, but also increase financial aid to immigrants, well, the immigrant may personally disagree with the social policy of the Democrats, but what does it matter to them? This isn't their home. They have no attachment to the culture of the region. They might even assume that, yeah, the culture here is liberal compared to what I'm used to, so what difference does it make? In conclusion, why are cities always so liberal? The blame can be placed squarely upon the effects of civilization and development themselves. That mankind's shaping of the environment to meet his needs and desires has created environments that insulate from the natural world and breed idealism which grows into what we call social liberalism. Cities and urban areas are merely the greatest concentrations of this, and this is not exclusive to urban and rural communities within the same country, but observable even between countries at different stages of development. But what do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The US of Z thanks you for watching, Mr. Z, out.